Mark Shostrom has like 40 years in the special effects makeup business for film and television. On his resume, you know the films, Nightmare on Elm Street, several movies in that series, Phantasm 2, From Beyond, he worked on The X-Files. His Instagram bio calls him the Julia Child of makeup effects <laughs> and screenwriter of horror with a heart. Mark Shostrom, thanks for coming, man. It's great to talk hey, to you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Why the chef Julia Child? Is it because you're always kind of cooking stuff up back in your in your lair? Well, no, that's actually a strange story. One of my favorite nicknames. I uh, in the '80s when I was doing Phantasm Two, I had to do a lot of makeup effects on uh, Angus Scrim, and he's he's melting in this whole stage of makeups. And I would incorporate, in addition to the foam rubber pr prosthetics and the makeup, I would incorporate certain food products like. Uh, yellow tinted yogurt a little yellow tinted milk some gelatin and when his neck is tearing open i used actually chicken skin which i super glued to the rubber so as i'm putting all the stuff on him he you know we talk and you know what's that you're doing now and he says, oh it's gelatin and what's that you're doing now it's yogurt oh, it's chicken skin and he paused and he goes mark you're like the julia child of makeup effects <laughs> and so it stuck, and I, I love that nickname. Uh, Phantasm marked me. Uh, you know, I think we all, especially being a child of the 80s, and this was like late 70s, but I remember I wasn't supposed to, I wasn't old enough to see Phantasm, and somehow I, we, Phantasm was on. I was watching unsupervised, and I felt like a grown-up, you know. But Angus Grimm, as the tall man, marked me you probably hear that story a lot like oh my god the first time i saw that guy he was in my dreams right yeah i, I actually saw the film in 1980 the first one uh i don't remember if it was in a the theater might have been but yeah i thought it was like really odd and original and slightly twisted and never gave it another thought after that that i'd be working on a sequel or two sequels actually i've heard that angus scrim is like was like the nicest guy like oh. i guess as soon as the camera turned off and he wasn't looming and bringing down otherworldly death he was like this oh. genteel old soul right just the sweetest man you could ever hope to work with i loved working with him he when he showed up at my workshop the first time he uh, he brought his dog cap he asked permission would it be all right if i bring my dog cap inside i'm like of course you know yeah, he's a real sweet guy. Yeah, com complete opposite of what he portrays in movies. In the films, the Phantasm series, they are, I think, known if arguably for two things, the tall man and the sphere, right? The silver flying ball of death. Did you work on the sphere? Were you involved with that at all? No, but uh, a couple of stories about that is uh, one day I was curious. I'm working on the prep for the movie, and Don and I were having a meeting about something. I said, hey, there's something I've always wanted to ask you. And how did you come up with the idea for the spheres? And he told me it just, he saw it in a dream and he threw it into the movie. But uh, as far as the spheres, when I met with Don on Phantasm II, the project was very secretive. It had a couple of different titles. It was Morningside, then it was American Gothic. And he hired me. And even before I started prep, he, he, he said he needed somebody to do the silver sphere effects. And I recommended my friend Steve Patino. And I called Steve that night and I said, hey, I'm doing this movie. Some people are going to call you. I can't tell you what it is, but you want to do this. <laughs> and what is it? What is it? Well, it's called American Gothic or whatever. And he's American what? But yeah, Steve Patino was a, an effects guy who specialized in uh, fiberglass molds. And he was uh, really good at the mechanical and the anything involving mechanics and plastics and things like that. And I knew he'd be the guy for it. What are you doing for Phantasm? Were, were you doing live casts? You know, I don't know if it's latex. Uh, you tell me what the terminology is. What were you making? Everything involving makeup effects on the actors. And that, of course, began with life casting, which is putting a material called alginate on the face to get an impression of the face. Then you pour a replica and plaster. And with the case of Angus, I had to do his hands, faces, expressions, and uh, I kind of worked my way into it with him. 
In other words, I started with the, his hands and we put them on a table so he could watch us and see the material, how the material worked and what we did. Then we did a relaxed, normal phase so I could use that to sculpt prosthetics. And then we eased him into expressions, which means basically you've got a material that's got like a, a seven minute setting time and at the six minute mark, somebody calls it out and I, I say, Angus, hold the expression. And he'd hold a scream for like a minute and then the material sets. So that was the life casting. That's just the first, you know, week. And then there's all the sculpting and the, the making of the prosthetics, the fake heads, the monsters, putting the mechanics in it, painting everything. And of course, going to set and doing the application. So it's the whole thing. Plus with Don post-production, like months later, you know, I thought of a new idea. Okay. So somebody's in the, you know, they're under the plaster. I don't know what, if it's actual plaster, but I think it's, 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 I, it. it's a soft material that Dennis used to cast your teeth. Okay. All right. So someone's under it. I'm guessing the eyes are closed. They've got the tubes coming out of the nostrils. No. They're encased. The, no? The tubes, the tubes kind of out of the nostrils. I don't know where people get that, make that mistake all the time. They used to do that in the 1930s and 40s, where they literally would put straws in your nose and use actual plaster right on the face. But with modern materials starting in the 70s and 80s, we switched to alginate, which is a soft material that it mixes up. It looks like pancake batter is kind of thick and that goes on the face and it's cold. And then it, it warms up and solidifies into a kind of a rubbery gel, but because it's floppy when it's solid, if you pull it off, it'll lose its shape. So you have to have, when the algae is set on the face, you have to back it up with plaster bandages like a, a doctor would use for making an arm cast. The outer plaster is where people see the pictures of people underneath, they think they've been plastered. Well, no, they actually don't have plaster touching their skin. The whole thing, the alginate and the bandages comes off at one go, and then you pour another type of plaster into that to get the replica of the face. So the eyes are closed. Um, there's no straws. What you do is you put the material carefully around the nose, and you make a, a mixture so that you know it's not going to drip into the nose. And you have several people working at the same time. And whoever's doing the, the face and the nose area, as soon as that nose area and the mouth are covered, you, one person stays on that area. Usually it would be me. And you, you talk to the person underneath. They can hear you. You're doing fine. Your breathing holes are open. How are you doing? We have hand signals, you know, pat on the shoulder. This means I'm doing great. This means take it the fuck off me. <laughs> Never get that. No, nobody's ever freaked out on you. I mean, you've been there and they're like, oh my God, they're, it's hot. I'm claustrophobic. I, no, I've done in my makeup career. I did a, a six year old girl once for Elm street three and for phantasm. I did an 85 year old woman. Everybody's been cool across the board, but there was one guy in Dick Tracy who was a stunt man. We had to make a life mask and he was underneath it. I don't remember his name, but he's got the stuff on him. And I said, how are you doing? And he's like, he was literally shaking um, because he was not in control. He, this guy would jump off buildings. He would set himself on fire and he was in control. But as soon as he was encased, we were in control. And that was it really, he was actually physically shaking. I'll never forget that. So that was the only almost freak out I ever, I ever saw. Excuse me. Did you tell me, we were talking before we actually set up the interview, that your first live cast or one of them was your girlfriend? Is, is that right? Let's see. Yeah, it must have been. Yeah, who else? Who, what better guinea pig, you know? you know. Well, what's the story on that? I mean, you're like, hey, honey, I need to practice, or was it an actual gig or what? Actually, the first live cast I did was on my mother in 1976, but I, I didn't know how to do it. I was going by this makeup book by some guy who didn't know what he was doing. And he had these, and basically when you mix the alginate that you put on the face or the head or whatever, you mix a huge batch or several kind of staggered batches. So it essentially all goes on at once. And this guy in the book said, well, you, you mix six little batches, these tiny little spoonfuls, and then you mix your water into that. You put it on, then you mix your other one. It was completely screwed up, but I'm my poor mother's lying down on a couch 
with a, I guess I had a plastic garbage bag on her, her hair. And I've got this book open and I've got all the little things laid out. And it was excruciating for her because I'd put it on and cover part of her. And then I'd have to like uh, turn the page in the book and mix the other stuff. And she did not enjoy the process too much at all. So when I came to California years later, I finally started to meet, meet people in the business, learn how you really do it. And the materials had improved a bit by then. So my girlfriend became number two as far as figuring out how to do it. And I did it all at once. I was really careful. I said, you can't move, you know, don't jump up and don't run across the room. And it came out beautifully. And it actually got me my first job. The, the resulting life cast looked so pristine that it got me a job on a movie. What was the job? Uh, it was an AFI film called Violet, which was my first movie job. And I didn't have much of a portfolio. It was a few makeups on myself. And when I went in for the interview, I thought, as an afterthought, I thought, let me just bring along the life cast of my girlfriend. And, and I brought that along like a, an idiot. But the producer looked at it and he was very impressed. And he later told me, you know, the makeup in my portfolio wasn't, you know, uh, superlative or anything. But he looked at the, the life mask and he thought, if somebody can do that, they can do the scar for this movie. So he hired me. So I've got to ask the college term paper question, Mark. But, you know, I, I had the opportunity to meet uh, Tom Savini down at a horror convention in Texas, you know, and I'm. I'm fanboying and, you know, what was your inspiration, man? You know, <laughs> but, you know, with Savini, I think he talks about Lon Chaney and, and, you know, the man of a thousand faces, oh, yeah. the fan of the hunchback. He got Jack Pierce and his work on Frankenstein, uh, John Chambers, Planet of the Apes. So if I ask you, well, Mark Showstrom, who was your inspiration to get into the makeup biz? All of, all of the above. I mean, when I was a little kid, you know, I, I watched Frankenstein and, uh, I had never seen a Lon Chaney movie, but I, I read Famous Monsters starting in 1964 or 60 years ago. And I'd, you know, they would show pictures of Jack Pierce and Lon Chaney doing the makeup. And yeah, all those guys were inspirations. And John Chambers was, uh, was huge. And Dick Smith, of course. John Chambers was the only sort of contact I had before, when I moved to L.A., because I'd corresponded with him in a few letters back in 1976, 77. And he wrote me back handwritten letters, which I still have. And when I moved to LA, I didn't know anybody in the film business, but I had his phone number and, uh, I called him up and I said, Hey, I'm the guy that used to write you back in Washington, DC. Do you remember? Yeah, come on over. And so, uh, yeah, all inspirational and seeing Dick Smith's work in, uh, in the exorcist, and, and Little Big Man, I remember seeing Little Big Man in 1970 and, and when I was living in Hong Kong, and you know, it blew me away. Beautiful I can't work. imagine the guy who's working at that level and he's answering his own mail. I mean, he's like, hey, I, oh, look, here's a letter from Mark. Same, right? with, same with Dick Smith. You write him a letter, he writes you back. Uh, in Dick's, Dick's case, he typed them, but John Chambers hand wrote his. And his writing was really, really I can't read this, you know, I'm looking at it with a magnifying glass. Oh, you know. <laughs> With Dick, you know, I've got a whole collection. I must have probably 10, 10 or 12 letters and a couple of postcards from Dick. Uh, real keepers, like he sent me one on Amadeus Stationery, which is really cool. But yeah, Dick will write back everybody. And uh, same with phone calls. I mean, he did. I don't say he will. He did. Uh, that's why he's a legend is he was so generous with helping so many people. Kind of a Roger Corman-esque, you know, Corman would take uh, a lot of people in, give them a shot, you know, he'd just bring them in, yeah. oh, you work cheap, you work fast, uh, all right, well, here, you know, here's something to work on. Yeah, edit this film, maybe if you do all right, I'll let you direct my next, you know, space picture or whatever. Little names like James Cameron, you know, that kind of thing, you know. I think James Cameron sculpted the ship with the breasts on it from Battle Beyond the Stars. Did he? Um, Yes, and now I mean, direct. Of course, he directed Piranha Two, which is a classic. But, but you know, of course, now he's he's James Cameron. But I love to hear. Well, these I remember I was stories. working on two, three Corman pictures in like uh, eighty two, Forbidden World and Android, and uh, to get from the makeup effects lab to the bathroom in the other building, you had to walk through this 
soundstage and the, the Skotak brothers and Jim Cameron, I think, had built the whole Manhattan replica for Escape from New York. It was on the floor. So literally you'd walk on this door and you'd step over Manhattan to get to the bathroom. But I remember seeing Jim Cameron there a couple times and uh, working on Android. Back to Tom Savini, uh, he was talking about, yeah, like he worked on Romero's Dawn of the Dead, 1978, I think. Yeah. And he was talking about how much he hated the blood, right? You got a zombie film, there's blood, I mean, gallons of blood, but it, it looked like sort of that apple red colored house paint. And I guess he hated it, but Romero liked it. So, Mark, you tell me, like, what's good blood? Like, if you're making blood, that blood in uh, Day of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead, 1978. I remember reading uh, an interview with Tom Savini about it, and he said it was Nextel, N-E-X-T-E-L, simulated blood made by 3M, 3M in Minnesota. And I had read an article about that while I was living in Hong Kong in the 70s. It said this magic blood that doesn't stain costumes is going to change Hollywood, which is the one that Tom used on... Uh, Dawn of the Dead. So in 1980, when I first moved here, I ordered a bottle of it. And it was like this orangey red, opaque house paint. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't come out of, it didn't stain clothing, but it didn't look like blood. So at the time, myself and many others were using, uh, you know, Ben Nye makeup company made a blood for stage, which was a bit purple. A couple of companies made blood, Max Factor, had a great Technicolor blood, but that was discontinued, and that was only for Technicolor film. So I would make mine out of corn syrup and uh, you know watercolor or whatever. Didn't know what to new to use until I got a hold of Dick Smith's blood formula around 1981, and Dick had developed a blood formula for Midnight Cowboy. It was its first time use, and that's the same blood he used later in The Exorcist, Taxi Driver all the way through the hunger. And that was the blood that was adopted by everyone. Rick Baker, Rob Bottin, all of us used Dick Smith's blood formula because it was the best. And they had, uh, Dick had refined it on The Godfather because in The Godfather, Coppola decided to test all different types of blood formulas and movie blood. They even tested pig blood. And they, Coppola at the end gave Dick Smith's blood formula the vote for the most realistic blood. And that became the industry standard and still is today. So I went back at your recommendation and rented, it's like a buck 99 on Amazon, uh, The Mutilator, 1984, oh. which is a film you worked on. It mm -hmm. is the, I think, one of the quintessential 80s. It's so 80s. It's so oh, 80s. The kills, though, are damn good. Uh, and it, so I'm you know, going back 40 years but I, I, I'm doing this for memory, but there was a pitchfork. He came out of the barn with a, was it a chainsaw? I mean, oh, tell me, tell me about the mutilator real fast, Mark. <laughs> Basically, the nutshell is uh, Buddy Cooper decided to make a horror movie and he didn't know who to call. So he looked, he found a Hollywood yellow pages and he found special effects, called a guy and this guy said, oh, he'd called my friend Anthony. And Anthony found out about the job, but he didn't have a portfolio strong enough to get the job. And I said to him, why don't you let us combine our portfolios? We'll send it to this guy in North Carolina and get the job. And he, Anthony resisted me on that. Finally, I convinced him, let's do this. I sent my work. We got the job. And when we, when we did the film, Anthony and I were kind of partners in the beginning, but at some point he, he had problems with his personal life and he kind of up and left. So myself and Ed Farrell finished the movie. Um, as far as the, the, the way that Buddy wanted to dispatch people, he used uh, fishing implements, you know, uh, except for the axe. The axe was an axe, but uh, there was the, the big pitchfork was, I guess, for piercing tuna. I don't know. But there was the gaff, the big hook, which is like a fish hook, only it's like, you know, the size of a dinner plate that was had a very famous scene which most people remember uh, essentially he was in the outboard motor of course for uh, gutting poor maury and you've got the uh, what the one scene where there's a guy who's literally in two pieces like he's a torso yeah. 
lying on the ground, but he's still dangerous. Yeah, of course. <laughs> he's still <Yeah>. acting. <laughs> 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 so is that you digging the hole for the actor? Are you the one making his legs with the jeans on him and the intestines? Uh, you know? Yeah, that was Anthony and I made that. And uh, Ed, Ed assisted Ed Farrell. Um, that was kind of a bit of a clusterfuck because the, uh, the first AD, this guy from New York, uh, decided to switch the schedule on us. Uh, we had like two weeks to go to, to shoot that effect. And he just wanted to kind of bust our balls. And he said, well, no, we're shooting that, you know. And, tomorrow so you have to be ready whatever it takes and we were close to being done but we still had to do the severed body we had we'd made the the crude body we had to cut it in half i had to finish painting the head we had to figure a way to to make the guts really quickly we didn't have time to sculpt and mold and paint that stuff so we used party balloons covered with melted gelatin and blood it worked great uh and that was out of necessity because we had to cook it up really quickly I've heard stories of people just pouring like apple pie filling and stuff onto bodies. A lot, a lot of food items. I had to make brains on a movie once, and I went to craft service and got some bananas and mixed it up with blood paste, you know, really quick, fling it against the wall. How's that? Oh, perfect. <laughs> you know? Well, if you're working with food stuff under the hot lights, and this is certainly back in the days of the hot tungsten lights burning at, you know, 2,000 degrees or whatever. Yeah, that's you know, the trouble. That's got to stink. Is, it'll go bad. Like uh, Angus Scrim at the end of the day with the yogurt on him, he'd be wearing that for 12 hours. He'd kind of, you know, kind of have a bit of an odor to it. Yeah. Talking here with special effects makeup artist Mark Showstrom, whose work I have followed for a long, long time. Evil Dead is, I don't know, it's another milestone film for me. And the trilogy, Evil Dead 1, Evil Dead 2, and Army of Darkness, which I just learned recently that they wanted to call the Medieval Dead, and they were turned down, and I feel that's a missed opportunity. But you worked on Evil Dead two is that correct yes and i saw a picture of you with ted Raimi, which is sam the director sam Raimi's brother he's in a shit ton of films but uh he played the evil horror hag uh, was it henrietta something like that Henrietta, yes bruce campbell referenced in his autobiography a scene where uh, henrietta is spinning from the ceiling and oh, the there's sweat. sweat coming out, and apparently you can see. And so I went back and oh, actually yeah. freeze-framed. I don't know. Yeah, you want to talk yeah. about the suit? The suit is a head-to-toe sculpture I did. It took me about a week. And, uh, yeah, that was a huge sculpture. If you go to – I'll send you some behind-the-scenes pictures. That was a head-to-toe suit. The only part of Ted Raimi that was real were the tops of his ears. Of course, they had color on the makeup. Even his tongue. I made a rubber tongue for him uh, and dentures contact lenses he was 100 percent covered well 99 percent, except for the top of the ears but that suit was about you know an inch and a half to two inches thick in places of plastic foam and we're shooting in in north carolina during a heat wave and it would become i don't know 90 degrees on stage finally we got air conditioning which helped a bit but still, he was going through such physical rigors. You know, I mean, being in a suit under prosthetics and a heat wave on a sound stage for, you know, 10 hours up on a wire spinning around. Yeah, he was sweating a lot every day. We would uh, take his rubber feet off at the end and you could literally pour the sweat out. Oh, it was wow. pretty gross. Is it true that you guys had to have like an oxygen tank for him or is that just... Uh, no, he had... Basically, when we, uh, it came, it was so hot there, and I knew it was going to be a problem. I uh, went to the production manager and said, we need to get air conditioning. Well, we can't afford it. That's going to cost, you know, $10,000. And I, I went to Sam, I believe, Sam and Robin. I said, look, if we don't get air conditioning, your brother's going to die. Okay, seriously. So they paid for air conditioning for this. Uh, it wasn't a soundstage. It was actually the gymnasium of an old school. And we had many of these big tubes to direct the airflow and ted had his own tube so after every take we'd open up unzip the back put one of the air conditioning tubes right there and just blow the cold air right in in there directly but no he never had oxygen or anything like that ash williams bruce campbell's character the iconic ash lops off his hand with a chainsaw 
and the hand becomes a character, like a new character in the film. You were involved with the iconic hand, Mark, is that right? Absolutely, yeah. In yep. what way? Creating it, uh, making all the different versions of it for different uses. Like uh, we had one independent radio controlled hand for movement. Like when Cassie is holding the hand and the light comes on and the hand is moving. There was a version to run across the floor. There was a version which was a stump with the palm up for being on the floor, a, a version with the palm down for being on the floor, stunt versions, all these different types of hands. And plus the, the ones that begin the effect with Bruce, with his, uh, what happens? I forget what happens. We had a couple of different hands for him as the, the, the nails come out or whatever happens. I forget. It's been so long. Uh, it's been 40 years, but you know, he's the hand becomes possessed and he decides he's going to like separate himself from the evil and then the hand's scampering around <laughs> and it's making that little sound that little it's actually i mean it's hysterical it, it's just iconic so and the first effect we we shot was involving his hand that was my we'd I'd spent you know four months prepping and i knew i had to deliver and i wanted to look good on the first thing we filmed which was bruce dragging himself across the floor and stabbing his hand. So I'd worked hard to make sure this, this damn thing would stab when you or would bleed when you stabbed it and all that. Um, so there's a lot of pressure on me. If that first film defect had fucked up, uh, they might be looking at me going, why do we hire this guy? But it worked out great. Thank God. So much blood in Evil Dead 2. And, and it's funny because the tone of the films change. And I think that they smartly change. Evil Dead 1 is pure horror with, you know, there's some comedy in it. But, I mean, it's it's really a, it's comedy in the way that Texas Chainsaw had some darkly funny things in it. But Evil Dead 2 really ramps it up. But there's so much blood, like literal barrels of blood. When you're shooting or when you're creating, do you make up guys think to yourself, oh, my God, the MPAA ratings board will never go for this? Do you think like that? Sometimes you read a script like The Mutilator or Evil Dead 2, and you just know right away there's no way in hell that the MPAA is going to let this one go through as an R. You just have to accept it's going to be an X. Um it's funny you would mention the blood. Uh, the very last thing we shot on Evil Dead 2, after everything, even all the pickup shots and everything, was the blood shooting out of the walls, b blowing Bruce Campbell around the room. And you know, they were shooting at last because it was going to destroy the whole set. And Vern Hyde, the special effects guy, the mechanical special effects guy from Atlanta, had this tanker truck full of blood. It was insane. Hecked up, heck, uh, hooked up to all these pumps that were connected to the walls at different places. And I remember standing on the ladder above the set, looking down into it, watching the first take where the blood, Bruce is standing there, the blood starts to shoot out. I mean, it was like, like a rocket blast. It was insane. There was so much blood shooting out everywhere. Of course, just destroyed the entire set. So it was basically a, a one take you get five cameras on it or whatever it was it was absolutely nuts bruce campbell said that he was like sneezing blood for a week because it Not had just sure. i mean it shot. came out with great force yeah like a fire hose of blood the blood flood bigger than, way bigger than a fire hose just astounding in its scale of uh you know big holes in the wall like this with blood shooting out I heard somewhere, I want to say it was on one of the, some of the Friday the 13th films, but some of the special effects guys would go so over the top and they planned for the fact that, well, we know they're going to slice this out, but they were kind of tricking the ratings board. They're like, we're going to go so over the top that they'll slice this out, but they'll leave what we had originally intended. I guess we're going to desensitize them. Is that a myth or is that real? I've heard of that happening actually a lot with directors as well who shoot, uh, they'll submit their one version, which is the MPAA version, well knowing it's going to be cut. And they'll, so they'll cut, you know, five frames and resubmit it and say, well, we cut that part out. And the MPAA might look and go, oh, okay. All of a sudden you get it passed. So you get, 
your original intended product submitted and approved. Uh, I guess there's a method to the madness of that. Mark, is it just a joke? I mean, come on. I mean, are the, are, who are those guys and who's making the decision? And you know, yeah. I don't know. I have a big problem with censorship uh, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, it's ridiculous. There's a whole documentary called "This Film Is Not Yet Rated," and it's about. It literally is a documentary about trying to find well, who who are the people who are rating our films? And it turns out they have almost no qualifications of any kind. I think what you, have to have, you have to have a kid under eighteen. And I think they have a couple of clergy who are consulting, you know, but other than that, it's just random people. Well, what I don't get is, you know, here in the United States, you can't show. Uh, I remember watching American Horror Story, the first season. I'd never seen it. And uh, they're showing uh, American Horror Story and The Walking Dead. They're showing extremely graphic, gruesome things, people's heads being sliced and maggots and zombies just oozing gore and there was a scene or a shot in american horror story where it's a dream sequence or something of a woman floating and i noticed they blurred out her nipples and her pubic <laughs> hair okay they i can understand the pubic hair but you're blurring a woman's nipples but you can also show knives going into people neck people's necks you know the the, the american news shows suicides they show people getting killed and gory stuff all the time but they won't say shit and fuck on the nightly news words that everybody hears every day I'm like excuse me you worked on nightmare on elm street two officially two and three but did you work at all on one i saw you i saw the word uncredited what's that i about? did i worked uh my friend dave miller was doing freddie's makeup and he called me one day and uh when was that? Summer of 84. And he said, hey, I'm doing this thing called a Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, and I need some help in my garage, his garage workshop, because they keep having me make up this guy in this burn makeup. I bring him to the set. I have to wait to see if they're going to shoot. They never shoot with him, so I'm not getting stuff at my workshop done. So I spent a week, literally one week or maybe a week and a half at Dave's workshop. I remember sculpting on the Ronnie Blakely body at the end that she kind of rises out as she's a dead corpse. And, uh, I forget what else I did, but my, my daily task first was to make the foam pieces for Freddie shooting the next day. And the, the molds that Dave used were these little square dental stone molds that were very thin. And they, every time you bake them, you had to bake the foam. You had, every time you bake them, at 200 degrees, they would fall apart. So my day began, arrive at Dave's shop, have coffee, super glue the fucking molds together, <laughs> run the foam, close the molds, put them in, bake them, and then pull them out at the end of the day and they'd fall apart, super glue them together again. And then Dave would take the rubber pieces from the molds, go to set the next day, make up Robert England, sit around all day and they wouldn't film him so i was running foam it's called running foam making the foam pieces i was doing that every day for a week week and a half uh, just to keep dave supplied with his pieces i heard that freaking freddy glove was super heavy i mean come on you tell me you weren't tempted to just go over and put that sucker on or maybe it was guarded like the holy grail at that time i didn't go to set on the first one on the second one i remember i probably put the, the glove on to try it um I know I had to reference it uh, to, to go examine the blades because we had to make blades for Mark Patton's effects hands, like when his fingers grow, uh, the, the blades grow out of Mark's hand. I do know that at the end of, uh, by the end of the third film, when we're, in, we're about done shooting is like the last day or the second to the last day you hear somebody announce, okay, you know, make sure, you know, we have the Freddy glove handy. And at the end, the last day of shooting, the Freddy glove is missing. Who has it? Because somebody would make off with it to sell it or something like that. But they had many, many versions of it. What did you do on two and three? I, I, I mean, it's a broad question, but. On two, I did the whole transformation scene in the middle of the movie of uh, Freddy, Mark Patton turning into Freddy Krueger, the hands, the arm effects, the tearing open of the body and all that. That was, you know, 40 seconds of screen time was 10 weeks of work. And on three, I did uh, 
just a multitude of different effects. Uh, myself, Kevin Yeager, and Greg, Greg Canham. Lots of stuff for the good old days of 80s horror. It is uh, more and more a world where we see CGI. And I'm not one of those guys who's like, uh, you know, the kind of the hipster man back in the day when effects were real, man. But I also, you know, there is, um, I don't know, there's a gravity to practical effects that sometimes I miss whenever you see the digital seams, you think, oh, wow, you know, I wonder how long that took to render, which is a, you know, kind of a different thing. And uh, so I, I go back and forth. I, I, I wish I was seeing more practical effects, or maybe I am and don't realize it. Do you have that conversation about the old school and the new ways, et cetera? Mm, well, that's, that's a, a broad topic. I mean, it's funny, just even the, the word the term practical effects to me, when I hear it, I just kind of shake my head. I'm just go, well, they're effects. I knew them in the eighties as effects. Of course, today, everybody's practical effects, CG. Um, <clears throat> I have mixed feelings, but I mean, CGI can do incredible things. I think what impresses me most about CGI is the environments they can create. Like uh, when I saw Mind Hunter, they were creating all these townscapes from the seventies in Pennsylvania or whatever, there was just repeated layers of environmental effects, which looked fantastic, just beautiful. When it comes to creature work, I'm of course more critical and they can do amazing things. But if often, if you have a creature designer who's only worked at a mouse, their entire career, who has no sculpture background, no, hands-on sculpture or anatomy lessons, you're not going to have the reality uh, inside that, that creature. And one thing that I've, I've found that's always missing is weight. You can have a, a person in a rubber suit, like, you know, Bob Picardo in Explorers walking through and you can sense the weight because there's a physical person in there, which has weight. You don't get weight in CGI is very, you can get the skin textures, you can create hair and water, but to create a, a big creature that's lumbering across the screen that actually looks like it's heavy, to me, they've never accomplished that, or I haven't seen that movie. And if I can do a little, you know, just to clear the air, I'm not dissing CG. For anybody who's watching, like when I see, when I see Godzilla, you know, when I see, um, Pacific Rim, when I see Ex Machina, et cetera, and I see the, the f amazing, you know, just uh, world building that is done correctly and, and well, there's so much imagination. Well, it's the, it's the trick of knowing when to use CG or practical and knowing when to blend the two, like Guillermo del Toro does the blend perfectly in Pan's Labyrinth with the goat creature and in Ex Machina. I just saw that for the first time, maybe six months ago, I was blown away with the creation of that robot woman. And that was a mixture of prosthetic makeup and her, her movements, her body and CG to create all the insides and the see-through parts. It was beautifully created. And that was a, a mixture, a blending of the two, a correct blending of the two. Very effective, beautiful work. Did you work on Generations? Is that right? I did. Yeah. For about Star two, Trek Generations, the film which combined the original and Next Generation casts. It's kind of a polarizing film. What did you do for Generations? I began by doing Klingon makeups with Greg Nelson and a couple of other people. But I also did some sculptures for the movie for uh, Patrick Stewart and Brent Spiner. Uh, for Brent, I had to do... There's a scene where um, Jordy has to twist the top of Data's head and lift it off. And I, I had to sculpt a complete wraparound forehead piece for Brent. In fact, uh, I remember working for Michael Westmore. Then I said, I'd, uh, if you don't have any pictures, I need to see Brent. Uh, so Brent actually sat in front of me while I sculpted the details of the way his forehead wrinkles went and all that. And for Patrick, they did some post-production work and they'd finished shooting all his stuff in Generations and he was off doing a play and his hair was a different length, but he couldn't cut it. 
So Richard Snell, a makeup artist who's passed away, he did a ball cap on Richard on uh, Patrick, but uh, it was a scene over the shoulder, a Christmas shot over Patrick's shoulder, where he's got the the bald head and the hair. But I needed to make uh, a neck to cover the ball cap join, which is all funky and weird and wrinkly. So I had to basically duplicate Patrick Stewart's neck and uh, the, his shoulders up into his forehead. So it's kind of a disguise makeup camouflage thing. You never know it's there. Oh, I got to go it's find one that. quick shot. If you blink, you miss it. I got to go find that somewhere. By the way, I feel I just felt betrayed when they left Kirk's corpse. First of all, he dies by falling down. That bothered me. Greatest captain in the history of Starfleet. And then they just leave him under a pile of rocks to get eaten by the foreign planet vultures. And then they fly uh, away. I, got, I have issues, Mark. I feel grief over the death of Kirk in that way. Just say it. Uh, you worked on uh, Voyager, is that right? Or DS9? Which one? I worked or on, actually, I was working at the same time on DS9 Generations and Voyager Prep. So I was kind of hopping back and forth on all three for a while. You making Ferengi and stuff, or uh, or what are you doing? No, I was doing a lot of sculpting, guest stars in deep space, sculpting for Voyager, stepping in to do sculptures and applications on Generations, all within like a month period. And then when Voyager started up in earnest, Michael Westmore hired me as the last staffer on that. Do you feel like sci-fi, horror, I don't know, do, do makeup people tend to fall into those genres simply because they tend to be more makeup intensive? Or was that your passion? Were you like, oh my God, I want to work horror sci-fi? Or does it, does it work like that? There's a hell of a lot more makeup effects in sci-fi and horror screenplays, obviously. So yeah, you just, if I look at my resume, you know, there's a lot of horror. There's some sci-fi, maybe one or two fantasy I'd rather work on dramas, actually, but they're not makeup effects intensive and heavy. I'm looking here at a couple of other uncredited roles. David Cronenberg's Videodrome, classic. The Beastmaster, classic. John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness, classic. <laughs> well, why uncredited? I mean, did they just bring you in to solve a problem? What happened? Uh, a lot of people get uncredited. You come in and do work for a few weeks, and you're not the main person. Or in the case of Forbidden World, uh, the production manager was too cheap to give everybody credit, which has always bothered me. I mean, it's not that expensive to submit a name to be put in the credits, but sometimes you get lost in, if you're there for a week and the rest of the crew is on the film for four months, you might not get on the list or they'll spell your name wrong. So, Hey, Mark, we, we give credit here. You, you have full credit. Right here on this Thank you. No, I always give credit, too. I mean, I'm, it's a big thing of mine. People do the work they should get credit. In fact, on Deep Star 6, I had 24 people working with me, and I submitted all their names at the end of the production. I said, here's the list. Here's who did what. The line producer just arbitrarily picked 10 of the 24 and gave them... I mean, I had specific people on specific jobs. Painter mechanical animatronics and this idiot whoever did it i forget who it was just arbitrarily picked less than half those names and put them down as creature guy creature guy creature guy creature guy come on people busted their asses for five months on that and you can't even give them credit yeah. you know fuck people like that mark you are a, a library of stories anecdotes information just good stuff I would love to. I wish we were just, you know, having coffee. We'd just probably keep going here. But um, thanks. Thanks for squeezing me into, uh, you know, your Absolutely. life, your schedule, for talking about so much of your work. I, I had all these other things we could have. We could have talked about the X-Files. and We could have talked about you. Know, but uh, I think I probably better call it. Otherwise, we'll be here in, until tomorrow. For those who want to know more, how do people find you and your work? Yeah, I'm on Instagram and Twitter. I'm a, I use a special secret code which is my real name, <laughs> unlike most people. Yeah, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, which I don't do much social media, less and less these days. Um, is there a place where people can see um, 
kind of a portfolio or is the best thing just to Google your name, Mark Shostrom? You, and then they can just... I have a YouTube thing and it's got my reel. Let me, I'm not even sure what the name of it is at this point. I don't, I don't oh, just shoot it to it. me and I'll put it in the description box. Uh, okay. No, yeah, no need to, to derail yourself now, but yeah, send it to me and we'll send that link to everybody. Yeah, and if you have IMDB box. Pro, I think it links to my reel. I'm not, I don't do too much self-promotion and all that. And uh, No, your work's terrific. Man, you are a almost half century veteran of the business and you've got so much good stuff out there. And for those who are fans of the, these genres like I am, it's just an honor to be able to hang out and talk. So I'll put those links in the description right. box and, and all good stuff and all safety and uh, all my best for 2024. And let's, uh, let's chat again someday. All right. Thank you, Seth.